Welcome to We're Only Human, a podcast focused on blending research and practical advice to help today's HR, talent, and learning leaders improve business outcomes. Let's welcome your host, Ben Eubanks. Greetings and welcome to a new episode of We're Only Human. I'm Ben Eubanks, your host, and I am so glad to be with you today. Today's show is brought to you by WorkHuman, and I'll give you a few more details on that in a moment. But first, I have a quick announcement. As this is airing, I'll either be in Toronto at the HR Professionals Association, the HRPA conference, talking about metrics and evidence, using those to improve our HR practices, or I'll be in the Caribbean on the HR conference cruise, speaking about how HR leaders can actually lead change management, not just sweep up the mess after it's all said and done. I really enjoy visiting with my HR peeps, and if I'm going to be in an event near you, please don't hesitate to reach out. I would love to connect in real life. Social media and LinkedIn are nice, but there's no substitute for face-to-face conversation, and I love those absolutely. Speaking of events that I'll be attending, I am thrilled to announce our new sponsor. This episode of We're Only Human is brought to you by Work Human, the HR event of the year. This year's lineup includes Amal Clooney, Brene Brown, Simon Sinek, and a historic panel of Me Too uh, on the Me Too movement featuring Toronto Burke, Ashley Judd, and Adam Grant, uh, one of my favorite speakers. You can find out more about Work Human at workhuman.com, and you can join us. Yes, us. I'll be there at the event uh, in Austin on April 2nd through the 5th. You know, I had a chance last year to attend the event, and I really was just blown away, not just by the speakers, the high-quality speakers there, but by the number of friends that I, I made at the event and the number of friends that I saw at the event. Um, as, a, as a big fan of Adam Grant's research, I, again, went a little fanboy. I was so excited to hear him uh, speak last year, to see his keynote. I thoroughly enjoyed that. And I actually referenced it um, just last week to a friend because there were some things there that I picked up that I just – so much enjoyed so i I really can't say enough positive things about the event and again i'll be mentioning them a couple more times in the the coming months thankful to them for being a sponsor hey if you want to check out the the website that's workhuman.com if you want to build your own connections build your knowledge improve yourself as an hr leader i definitely encourage you to check that out now for our featured guests i actually saw earlier this month where the department of labor was holding a panel discussion focusing on the employment of senior workers one of the industry leaders asked to speak at the event was Catherine King, and she's the head of talent acquisition at Allied Universal, one of the nation's leading security services firms. And I was actually able to get Ms. King to agree to join me on the podcast to talk about what it's like working at, working at an enterprise organization that hires more than 90,000 people, yes, 90,000 people per year, with a keen focus on employing more senior individuals. It's kind of a primary focus for them in the coming, uh, the coming months, coming years. You know, it's really a great conversation, and I I encourage you, as always, to be ready to take some notes. She covers some great ground on how to hire by giving people a greater purpose and also talks about how to leverage referrals as a tool to drive better results in hiring. And again, those referrals are not just for internal but for external referrals as well. Again, it's a a neat distinction, and one thing I've talked about a couple times in the last few weeks with companies that are trying to figure out how to improve their their uh, hiring rates and everything else in such a low unemployment market they're having challenges finding people and one of the things i'm encouraging them to do is think about external referral programs so we talk about that a little bit as well in the conversation hope you enjoy it i know you will and if you, as always if you have a comment a question feel free to reach out um, always happy to to share to share learn more about you what you're looking at what you're working on what you think about the episodes um, feedback is important to us now on with the show Welcome to We're Only Human. I'm your host, Ben Eubanks, and today we're talking about recruiting. What if you had access to a population of trained individuals with years of experience and expertise at their command? Well, in today's tight labor market, that's a dream for many employers, but my guest is going to give us some insights on how her company, which hires more than 75,000 people a year, is able to do this. I'd like to welcome Catherine King. She's a senior VP of recruiting and staffing at Allied Universal to the show. Great to have you, Catherine. Thank you, Ben. Nice to be here. I'm, you know, I was telling you a minute ago, I'm really excited to hear some of the insights and things and uh, take some notes myself because I think you'll have some good stuff to share. <laughs> Just to get us started a little bit, tell us a little about who you are and what you do. Yes. So, as you mentioned, I'm the Senior Vice President for Recruiting and Staffing Services for Allied Universal. So, I'm responsible for the strategy and execution of recruiting and hiring for exempt and non-exempt employees in the company. Tell us a little more about the company as well because for some of us, there's... 
I don't want to say you're under the radar, but you're one of those companies that we, <laughs> we are glad you're there when you're there doing the job right. And uh, right. If, we, if we don't have you around, then we, we realize that only that something bad happens. So give us a little bit of insight into the <laughs> right. company. And- yeah, so the private security industry is, is, an, is a very fast-growing industry that um, really took off um, after the nine, uh, you know, the, um, our tragedy, you know, on the 9-11 event. Um, Allied Universal is the largest private security company in North America. So over a year ago, two industry giants merged to form Allied Universal, and those were Allied Barton and Universal. Um, so the, the, the company now is the largest in North America. So we employ over 150,000 security professionals at our client sites across the country, and those sites number in the thousands. So the industries that we serve are very diverse and include such um, sectors as government, higher education, and universities across the country, healthcare, hospital facilities across the country, uh, chem, petrochem, and utilities, criti- critical infrastructure type of, of clients, and then uh, more commonly known, uh, the commercial real estate industry. Very interesting. So that's, yeah. that's a good insight on kind of the company and so on. Um, I threw that quote out because I saw the number out because I saw it on the website, but 75,000 people a year. It's hard for us um, to, to wrap our heads around uh, like the, the hiring of that. So, <laughs> yeah, it's actually higher than that. I, I was curious about that number. It's, we, last year, and I just did this research for our, our senior executives, we hired over 93,000 employees. So um, of those 93,000, we sorted through, and I know uh, the HR and recruiting professionals listening to this will appreciate the um, you know the science behind the science and art of sorting through the people who apply, which is actually a far greater number. So we had over 700,000 people applying for jobs last year with our company. But interestingly, of those 93,000 that we hired, uh, almost 11,000 were 55 and over in age, 55 years and old and older. Uh, so that's seven percent of the total workforce. And then right uh, currently we have 34,000 employees right now in our company that are 55 years and older. So that's about 22% of our total workforce. So I kind of alluded to this a little bit in the intro because I think this is an interesting area that some companies don't focus on. You know, they're they're thinking about either, you know, college recruiting or some other kind of angle. And mm-hmm. I'd love to talk about why the focus on seniors? What? What specifically does this population have to offer? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I think, you know, seniors are part of a wave of an emerging labor market. It's sometimes referred to as a silver tsunami, and that's the retirement of baby boomers. And as HR and recruiting professionals, um, we know um, that this emerging um, labor market, they are the children of the greatest generation. So there are some, um, there are some um, you know, work uh styles and, and competencies that they have that are quite unique. So uh, it, what we need to think about when we're thinking about this emerging labor market is that these uh, more experienced workers, they're, they're rather than seniors, they should be thought of as more experienced workers. They've passed the test of time in developing work ha- habits that are we all highly seek. They're highly sought after. And they include such skills as work ethic, soft skills, um, it's difficult to test out um, work ethic and screen, uh, you know, that among other populations that are, uh, you know, they're, uh, what are they, you know, they're emerging millennials and that sort of thing. So we want mature adults who've been successful in their careers to be part of our growing organization. This group has a lot to offer. Absolutely. Well, I think that's one of the mm-hmm. stories I love to tell from, from my own recruiting days. We had a, we had... Again, with smaller volumes, but but still similar and relevant. Um, we had an employee that was looking to retire. Said, you know, what's going on? You know, it's kind of out of the blue. Mm-hmm. Said, I just want to spend some more time with my, my grandkids. You know, I want to spend some more time, you know, doing some personal things, fishing, golfing, whatever that happens to be. And I, I just you know, need need to kind of peel back from the work a little bit. I said, well, let me check on something, and get back to you. And I came back and said, hey, what if what if we let you work two days a week? And you get to do the other things you want to do. You get kind of the best of both worlds. And he was blown mm-hmm. away, thrilled, so happy that he got to keep doing that. Because it wasn't that he hated his job. It's just that he wanted, he had more than one thing that he wanted to spend his time on. And to be able to split that up and do that I think, was, for him, a revolutionary life change. And he was, again, he got the best of all worlds in his, in his case. And so it seems like that sort of part-time opportunity or, again, not to exclude full-time, but even that kind of flexibility is something that really would appeal to that audience. 
Yeah, I, I, th- I think you touch on a very important point, and that is that work, it's not just about gainful employment and and earnings. It's also about having a sense of purpose. And I think in, in our company, and in particular in the security business in our company, it's about, you know, caring for our people and the businesses and our communities. It's um, being the eyes and ears, observing, detecting, reporting. We have very strong relationships with law enforcement, both local and federal, as well as with the Department of Homeland Security. So our work and, and the work our people do, uh, security professionals, it is a life services business. It's a serious business. And um, there, it's not uncommon. It's not a, 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 it's root, almost routine, I should say, that um, we hear about security professionals saving people's lives, preventing child abductions at, uh, at mat wards and hospitals, um, being uh, protecting students on campus and easing the minds of parents who are sending their students um, to campus with the rise of you know sexual misconduct on campuses. It's a huge worry for parents. So to have you know, more senior workers on site and, and having a presence at those client sites is very reassuring for our, for the communities that we serve. Those are, that's a sense of purpose that goes beyond just employment. Um, to think of it in, in the dollars and cents terms, at, you know, for, for this particular population, um, I think this is not a plug for our business, but I've seen it. I've seen how um, people um, have a sense of purpose, and there is a nobility to our profession, I always say, and because we are a life services business. Absolutely. Well, I would agree with that. It's, it's one of those things. <laughs> uh, one of the one of my favorite other podcasts to listen to, the host talks about when you retire and you kind of give up mentally on life, mm-hmm. life will give up on you, and so always finding something else yeah. to do, something else new to, to put, put your, your mind to, your effort to. And you know, we were... Even if you retire, quote unquote, from what you've been doing for a long time, that doesn't mean that you can't have an encore career. You can't have some other opportunity to, to still contribute. And again, I like the, the term nobility that you used because mm-hmm. that all of us kind of seek something like that, right? Yeah, I I, I think in, in in this in this business in particular, and you know, our company takes a lot of pride in training our uh, our people. So I like, for instance, you know, I came from the recruiting and and. Uh, Staffing business. I spent more than 25 years um, in large at large employers like in Adeco or Kelly Services, etc. And there's a lot of nobility there as well. I mean, at all of us that find gainful employment and careers for people is it's life changing. We affect people's lives when we put them in in positions where they're successful um, at a professional level. That's a wonderful thing. But in this business in particular, in this industry. It is a life services business, and I, I can't understate, you know, how important it is um, the, that you know, services that we provide, not just to the communities, but to law enforcement, uh, because we are the eyes and ears. And you hear the term first responder. I know that's a common term for all of us now in this age that we're in. Um, are, are people standing post in uniform, observing and reporting detect- and detecting are the first on scene. They are on scene. They are not first responders. They are on scene. Um, and, you know, we are um, often called upon to participate in providing evidentiary um, information to law enforcement in the pursuit of their, you know, their end for justice, et cetera. So um, that is an elevated sense of nobility um, that our people experience across the country. Just a little step, a step further. You talk about the recruiting. We're talking about recruiting pretty heavily. Let's talk about kind of the big picture. I know there's there hasn't been a company or a recruiter that I've talked to in the last six months that hasn't said something about having challenges finding people. You know, we're mm-hmm. in low unemployment. It's really just a tight labor market. Um, I, I interviewed last year the one of the the my guests called it a candidate's market, you know, they get they get to demand, just like in a home buying market, you know, we can, mm-hmm. buyers have have some control. Um, at times the candidates have some control now, they have some, some demands, they can um, really kind of control their own destiny. And I'm curious, do you see this as your company's kind of way of I want to say skirting that or addressing that head on I guess and, and kind of dealing with that challenge of Low talent availability yeah. in general. Yeah, I, I think you know, we're, we are we are living in an era, and that is, uh, in my career, I've, I've 
I've never experienced this level of demand and low supply. It's a, it's a, it's a classic economic model, right? So very, very high demand, a seemingly low supply. And I say seemingly because it's about finding the people, finding the people and, and, you know, sourcing the talent. I think those are terms that we're all familiar with. So I would say that this is a potential solution for that. And I, I almost hesitate to emphasize it because the competition for talent is so fierce. I think we all understand the term uh, war for talent. <laughs> it, is, it is definitely a war for talent. This community is underserved in talent sourcing, I have found, uh, because most companies now are very dependent on e-recruiting or online sourcing. And this demographic uh, we are finding is not as networked into this type of job search. Um, so we're missing this group as employers, uh, I, I have found, are missing this group as a source of valuable talent. Very interesting. So, again, not to get, mm-hmm. not to give away the secret sauce, or maybe you're, you're willing to share kind mm-hmm. of the playbook a little bit. <laughs> um, uh, I, think, I, I think it would be helpful, though, to talk about, you know, let's say you're, someone comes to you today and they have the chance, hey, we want to do this, we want to do a better job of this. Uh, maybe we've done some of it in the mm-hmm. past and we're, we're trying to hone our practices. What sort of recommendations would you have for an employer that's trying to make use of their senior or more mature yeah. population? I, yeah, I, I think that's a that's a that's a very important point is how to get started because just knowing about this and having a bit of a passive outreach to this community is really not um, a, a focused or strategic ap- approach to sourcing talent. And I'll start by saying that Allied Universal, we have the support of our CEO. He is very interested in this. Um, you know, in this program, and he actually was a brainchild. Our CEO is named Steve Jones. He he's um, was the brainchild of a program that we launched recently called Partners in Employment or PI. Um, and so, an element of this partner uh, Partners in Employment program is a um, a focus on community based organizations to serve as a partnership with senior groups in particular. And it's it's unique because it supports the senior community in the following ways. Number one, it helps older workers to attain meaningful employment, like I've talked about earlier, um, in, in multifaceted career paths. Um, there are many aspects to security that are not just about standing post or the, um, you know, the typical and somewhat unflattering mall cop image. <laughs> so we have many, many type of, of, of uh, employment opportunities for this group. Um, it supports senior groups' goals as well as because we contribute to their initiatives through our referral payment program. So our CEO has um, committed to put you know money behind this in terms of investment to those senior groups in the following way. So for every senior referred to us and hired, we will donate $400 to his or her group. Um, many of these groups are nonprofit, and any organization that's interested in partnering with us in this way should visit our website. And uh, we are, we're very committed to this, and we have a very focused effort, and as I said, CEO commitment coming from the top. Every um, executive of this company knows about this program, supports it, and then we report to our CEO on results every week. Um, and he wants to know how are things going in this particular area. So I think that commitment is very important at that level. I was going to say, if, in your case, it mm-hmm. came from the CEO. It sounds like um, Steve had this this kind of uh, epiphany that, that you could tap into. Mm-hmm. The vision, yeah. Vision, I like that word better. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. What if someone is, again, the people listening to this are going to be potentially driving this from the HR, the recruiting perspective. Is there a... I don't know a business metric necessarily, but yeah. is there a, a way to kind of pitch that in a way that it gets the rest of the executive team on board with the investment side of it? If they're going to, yeah, uh, yes, and I've I have benchmarked um, recruiting and hiring uh, strategies and techniques and tactics with probably the top twenty employers in the last six months. I've talked to my counterparts in the top in the categories that we were hiring in, so one hundred thousand hires a year. Um, are, there's only a few employees are in, that are in that category, frankly. So I think outreach is very important among, among the peer group uh, on this call to, to, to share ideas to, and develop your own strategies that are germane to your company. Um, and what, what I would say in terms of pitching this up, up the chain of command in any company, is that in all the companies I've benchmarked, um, hiring gaps equal revenue loss. 
right? So hiring gaps equal revenue loss. So if, there, if every company is driven by balance sheet and by uh, financial performance, especially in the for-profit space, and if it's a public company, even more so. So tying uh, labor gaps and skill shortages to revenue loss, or in some cases, revenue loss compounded, compounded by cost increase. Because if you don't have, um, you know, not filling a position is more typically associated with revenue loss, but it often can be down the down the chain, um, uh, can result in cost increase. So uh, I think finding the finding the the values in those two spaces and communicating that up the chain to business executives who understand those you know that terminology very well is also critical. And, and there are many people who can help do that within any most companies or organizations. Finance. Uh, finance is a, is a great place to start to quantify um, in those two areas. So a CFO, finance director can help, um, you know, give those um, values to those two areas so that, so that those, those discussions can be had. Excellent. I'm making notes over here like this is, this is, uh, this is good <laughs> advice, I think. I, right. I always try to make a, make a comment about using data or tying back into the business, and that was the perfect the perfect segue, I think, to really right. connect, right. connect those dots. Because yes, so absolutely. Us, so many of us mm-hmm. think about things. Again, I'm going to paint with a broad brush here for a second. Recruiters mm-hmm. often think about recruiting metrics because it's the world they live in, but in reality, when you're looking at the business metrics and trying to connect back to those, let's find a way to, to tie back to the things that matter to the business instead of just talking about. <laughs> Time to fill or the cost for hire because in the, oh, business, right. the, rest of the the rest of the leadership team that doesn't make them excited that doesn't interest them that doesn't help them understand how you're impacting the, the rest of the organization it just shows them that you're only focused on your little piece of the world and so by connecting those in again I, I love the advice to, to go to finance mm-hmm. find someone internally that can be a champion with you for this kind of thing instead of just trying to go it along it's a real change management kind of uh, aspect yeah. It, it, that's exactly right, Ben, because in, in our world, it's very easy to focus on our function and the metrics that are associated with our function, such as you said, time to fill, offer to hire, all of those metrics that are on the front end of, of a business. But it's really as the person flows through and contributes to the organization um, that, you know, that the business results will appear. Um, so if it's a ph- pharmaceutical company, it could be a scientist um, that's recruited and contributes to the R&D efforts of a pharmaceutical company. Um, in our world, the security business, it could be the safety of an organization. And, um, you know, not properly staffing when it comes to security could re- could have a very negative impact on a company's brand. Um, and those are, all, those, that, those are conversations associated with risk, right? So, so those are all, those, all, all of those things speak to balance sheet and company performance. And you will never find on a balance sheet employee satisfaction or retention. But those two things impact a company's financial performance almost more than anything. So a happy employee, keeping, a, keeping an employee happy and with the company contributes to a balance sheet, and yet it's, it's not really talked about. So um, I would challenge all of us to, you know, raise the game when it comes to having those conversations with our senior executives. Happily, our CEO gets it. <laughs> and so, so we all feel um, his, you know, interest in um, on almost a daily basis, certainly formally on a weekly basis. But um, I think those are important conversations to have with executives. And that's an internal, you know, mechanism for, for raising awareness. But there's also external things that can be done to increase um, awareness of the importance of hiring in this group in particular. One of the things you said a minute ago, I wanted to come back and touch on it just just very mm-hmm. briefly. We talked a lot about recruiting, and that's the, the world that, that you live in completely, but referrals and getting these people in and hiring them is one part of it. You mentioned retaining them. You mentioned keeping them. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you have any advice on that, but I wanted to give you the chance to throw it out there. And I think you, you touched on this partially earlier. You've already given us part of an answer, I think, and that's the purpose aspect. Give them something mm-hmm. to themselves. This isn't you standing in a position or just doing this thing, this task for a period of time. There's a bigger meaning to mm-hmm. it. But is there anything else you want to share there? Yeah, there, there is a bigger picture. Now, I think most companies um, are adopting referral programs that pay cash out to employees or for other employees. And those are fine. Those are very fine um, 
uh, tactics. Um, and we certainly have a very strong referral program for our security professionals to increase their compensation. But money isn't everything. So employee satisfaction is something that has to be uh, driven from the top um, into to, into the organization by sh- by showing appreciation for um, for our employees in various ways. Now, institutionalizing that often falls in the lap of HR, uh, but frankly, it is the responsibility of every manager to show appreciation to his or her employees in ways that that are non monetary. Um, and and I, and I think that every company um, has to think about how they do that um, and how they build that culture. I'll, I'll, I'll reference one one leader that I have a, a high regard for that is very unashamed about his order of priorities, and that's um, Richard Branson at Virgin Airlines, at uh, Virgin Companies. If he he's un, unashamed, says that he puts his first priorities with employees number one, customers number two, and shareholders number three. And he doesn't bat an eyelid when he says it. So that, that, you know, especially for public companies, that, that can be that, you know, at that level, at a CEO or chairman level, to publicly state in that order of priority is a very brave thing to do. As we all know, um, uh, many CEOs talk about shareholder value, right? And, and as I said before, employee satisfaction often does not appear on a balance sheet. But there's a CEO who gets it, who gets it and a chairman who starts with the employee and ends with a shareholder. And the irony there is that the shareholder will make more money with that set of priorities and more profit. So it, it's sort of reversing the, the picture and the chain of events when it comes to priorities for companies, starting with the employee, increasing their satisfaction, has a mirror effect to customers, right? So employee satisfaction equals, in most cases, customer satisfaction, which in turn will drive... Uh, customer retention, employee retention, and deliver profit to the shareholders. Absolutely, absolutely. I was listening to an interview this week. Um, they they had quoted Richard Branson and some things. were interviewing him about some some of his practices and things. And it, I was glad to hear you say that because I, I think more companies would do well to to focus on that that aspect of it instead of thinking about employees as the last thing if they think about them at all. Right. Uh, right. And right. One of, the, one of my favorite comments in the book I read last year was people don't work for companies, work for people. And so to think about, always be thinking about the human aspect and, and all the other good stuff there, it's, it's such a, a critical part, and yet it's easy to, to get past those things. You said balance sheet, but you're at the same time not losing sight of the human aspect of the workplace. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Just I, just to add to that comment, I don't want to, to carry on about this, but if you've ever listened to analyst calls for most public companies, um, you know, the, the employee, the great companies talk about employees in those calls. Um, and I, and I think, I, you know, I think that is, um, it's very easy to start chasing, um, the financials and chasing metrics associated with, with financials and not, um, consider, you know, the, the, the employee impact in terms of satisfaction, retention, sense of purpose. Those are all soft, um, conversations, if you will, that, <laughs> that most business people think is soft conversations, but they yield very hard results. Um, and, and I think more conversation with us, you know, as senior executives talking to our C-suite and to our board about the importance of this will 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 help and you know assist those executives with thinking in that way. Absolutely. Well, one of the other comments mm-hmm. I pulled from your website, it looks like you guys actually mm-hmm. won an award from uh, or on, we're on the Forbes Best Employers list. I think it was last year, correct? Yes, that's right. And, and Allied Universal, as I said, is, is a relatively new company. We're uh, two industry giants that formed over a year ago. With both companies had very strong brands, and the employer, um, you know, the employer award, uh, leading employers, and we've won multiple awards. Um, so yes, it is. It, it's this industry, like I said, is and this company in particular. Um, is a great place to work for, for the sense of purpose that we give to our employees as well as the, the work that they do every day for our clients. Well, I would say some of the ideas and things you've shared today, the philosophies, the, some of the even mm-hmm. leadership traits of um, Steve Jones, the, the CEO, I think those things are yeah. pretty obvious why the company is uh, has been awarded that and is featured on those lists. And so I would, uh, kudos to you. Thank well. you, Ben. I appreciate that. Any closing comments or anything you'd like to reiterate just before we wrap up? 
Um, I think you know, as far as the the focus on the on the oh, the more experienced worker, I like to say, fifty five and older. I I would just um, continue to emphasize that outreach is key, up close and personal, um, not over relying on an e approach, which is becoming very one dimensional. Um, and I, this group in particular, and this this demographic, really needs a personal touch. So getting out there, working with community organizations one on one, I think is very important. That's a, that would be the closing advice I would give. If so someone wants to find out more about Ally Universal's approach or some of your program, things like that, um, can you throw out the URL to the website so they can find that? Yes, certainly. It's aus.com forward slash community careers forward slash seniors. And then there are a no- number of other um, organizations that will also be in that careers page, such as veterans, faith-based, and students. I'll make sure we get that link in the show notes so anyone that's interested can can click right through and find out more about that because I think it's really it's really great. I don't I don't like the term best practices, but I like the term competitive practices. Let's we'll find someone that's doing something really competitive, really great, and try to try to mirror that to our to the best of our ability. And I think this is one that everybody would benefit from for sure. Perfect. Thank you so much, Ben, for inviting me. It was a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed the discussion today with Catherine. She had some really great insights, and I love the discussion about recruiting. Inevitably turns back to concepts like purpose, engagement, and retention. They're all connected, and I really uh, I love how that kind of happened without it being orchestrated. If you have enjoyed the episode and you know someone else that might find it valuable, please share the link with them. Take a moment to do that. Help the improve the HR community. My mission ever since the beginning back in 2009 has always been to improve the HR profession, one HR, goodness, to improve the HR profession, one HR pro at a time. And so feel free to share that, help us to continue that mission. If you have suggestions for future topics, or if you want to see the show archives, be sure to visit upstarthr.com slash podcast. That's upstarthr.com slash podcast. You can check that out, learn more, get all the details there. I'll catch you guys again next time on another episode of We're Only Human. Stay human, everybody. Thank you for listening to We're Only Human. Please take a moment to share this episode with another HR leader who might see it as a valuable resource in their daily work. For more information about the podcast and to see all our show archives, please visit upstarthr.com.